Okay. So with that, it looks like we have a nice, a nice group with us. And again, good morning. We're sorry about that slightly delayed start. And thank you for joining us today. For those who are joining us for the first time, A Closer Look is a series at ArtMet whose goal is to provide a forum for conversation and curiosity as it relates to both the work we do here at ArtNet Auctions and to the workings of the online art market writ large. Today's conversation will push that boundary even further as we contemplate the larger creative industries in New York and beyond. And we are in for a real treat today, everyone. My name is Colleen Cash, and along with being the Vice President of Auctions at ArtNet, I am delighted to be the host of today's conversation. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to introduce our panelists who will be leading us in today's discussion. And first, joining us from ArtNet Auctions is Jana Greenblatt. Jana is a senior specialist in ArtNet Auctions prints and multiples department with over 15 years of experience selling prints at auction. She began her career at Christie's in New York in their prints and multiples department and went on to serve at Phillips New York as a specialist in modern and contemporary editions for nine years. Jana is the lead specialist in our current New York, New York auction, a sale that showcases a variety of works by artists that have been inspired by our incomparable city, such as Andy Warhol, Romare Bearden, and Keith Haring, to name a few. Welcome, Jana. Thanks. And secondly, I am simply delighted to introduce, and we are certainly honored to have in our conversation today, Jonathan Benno. Considered one of the top chefs in the country, Jonathan's career spans more than three decades. A graduate of the Culinary Institute of America, Jonathan spent six years as the chef de cuisine of Per Se, during which time he helped earn the restaurant three Michelin stars and four stars from the New York Times. He was also named a Food and Wine Magazine's Best New Chef. After that, Jonathan spent six years at the helm of Lincoln Center's Lincoln Ristorante, where he gained critical acclaim for his contemporary Italian cuisine. In 2018, Benno launched Leonelli Taberna, a casual Roman-inspired trattoria, Leonelli Focacceria e Pasticceria, forgive my Italian, Jonathan, oh, a bakery and cafe inspired by the great bakeries of Rome and New York's history of Italian-American pastry, and Benno, a fine dining restaurant serving Mediterranean cuisine, which received three stars from the New York Times. So a busy 2018, I should say, Jonathan, if nothing else. It was. And these three distinct yet complementary projects represent the culmination of Jonathan's lifelong dedication to the hospitality industry. We are so excited to have Jonathan with us today to talk about these experiences, as well as some of the projects he has coming up. Jonathan, we are thrilled to have you. Thank you very much. Now, before we dive into it all, I do want to note that the Q&A function will be live throughout the duration <clears throat> of our conversation, and questions are encouraged and most welcome, and we will have a dedicated time following our conversation to go through those questions. But without any further ado, New York, New York, a city that is inextricable to our industries and a city that is the convening theme for our conversation today. You know, we've all, the three of us, we've cut our teeth in the wilds of New York and certainly our members of our audience, I'm sure, have done the same. And Jonathan, you know, you have built your career in New York, honing your craft alongside the likes of some of the best chefs in the world. Thomas Keller, Tom Colicchio, John Farnsworth, Michael Mina, Daniel Blue, just to name a few. You've worked not only in some of the city's most iconic restaurants, but also in some of the city's most iconic locations. You know, in the art world, we might talk about site specificity or the lasting influence of space and city on an artist's body of work. And we're curious, in the culinary arts, how do you think New York influences your approach to restaurants here and elsewhere? That's a tough, that's a tough question. Uh, you know, New York, New York is a city that is a city of, I don't know, 14 million people uh, and can sustain, you know, restaurants like the, the, the casual restaurant on the corner all the way up to the three Michelin star restaurant. Uh, I'll speak to the one that I worked at, you know, right at the bottom of, of Central Park and the Time Warner Center. So, you know, as you know, uh, 
in the art world as well. You know, New York is New York is an international city, uh, so we cater not just to New Yorkers and people from out, you know, outside the New York, the United States, but people from people from all over the world. And people come to New York to view great art, uh, perhaps also purchase great art, uh, but also enjoy great food. And, you know, I've been lucky enough for almost 30 years to make, to make a living in New York, to work for uh, some truly great mentors with, you know, a lot of great people over the years. And, you know, New York afforded me the luxury of working in very, very high end restaurants and not, not every city and not every city in the world can sustain, you know, the kinds of restaurants that, that we do have here in New York city. Sure. Absolutely. And, and likewise, you know, we talk about from the corner restaurant to the heights of a restaurant on the fourth floor of the Time Warner Center. Um, the elevation of, of culture and food and art in New York really is incomparable. And what a, what a learning ground for someone starting out in any industry. You know, and Jana, it great sort of segue to your world in the auction business. You know, you are currently heading, you know, Artnet Auctions, New York, New York sale, and a sale focused on art in general, which was an organization that really gave rise to some of the great artists of, of the contemporary temporary era. And, you know, one might wonder, like a menu is perhaps curated, right? The courses, the timing, the pairings, one might argue that so is an auction and, and putting together these works for sale um, in a way that is curatorially compelling and thus, you know, salient to, to the buyers of the world. Can you tell us about the importance of launching a thematic New York, New York sale right now? And are there any specific works in the sale that you think exemplify New York and what the city represents? Yeah, so um, to kind of echo what Jonathan said too, I mean, New York is a center for culture, for art, um, you know, and it's, it's sort of shapes history in that way that just the, the, the artists that come here from all over the world to make their way really define the entire culture. Um, and I think what, what made this sale so important to have now, one was just the events of the last year, just the fact that our way of life has been so inhibited by the virus. So many businesses shut down, museums closed for a time. And it kind of, you know, just wanting to kind of celebrate the history of New York and um, its support and, and you know, as a, as a place for art to thrive and a reminder of what's to come when hopefully all of this is over. Um, and I think the sale, it was such a great collection of, of works, you know, spanning generations and time periods. One of my favorite works in the sale, one of my favorite artists generally is Agnes Martin. Um, she just has such a singular voice. And while she's an artist that didn't necessarily spend her whole career in New York, it was those formative years when she was here as a student that she discovered the works of great artists and um, made friends with other artists, and this was really formative in her decision to, to pursue art as a career. Um, another favorite in the sale is the series of six lithographs by Ramir Bearden, the jazz series, which really celebrates that singular, um, you know, very American art form that was born in New York, jazz music. And I find this series so evocative. It has this bright colors and washy brushwork, and it really transports you to a jazz club. You can almost hear the music and the smoke filled rooms. Um, so I, I love that set. And then, of course, you know, there's many works in the sale that relate to our amazing cultural institutions and museums. Um, you know, MoMA, of course, you can find the work of Jasper Johns, Flags, which is in the sale, um, Robert Indiana, a block away. There's, of course, the public art sculpture, um, Love, right on 6th Avenue, which is a, a landmark. And then crossing the bridge into Brooklyn, um, you know, the, the Lichtenstein Imperfect was a print that was originally released as a fundraiser for the Brooklyn Academy of Music, BAM. Um, you have the Brooklyn Museum, who now has a show up by Cause, which uh, 
of course, had his start, you know, putting artwork, uh, you know, uh, modifying ads on bus stations and bus stops in the city. So everything from, you know, street art to um, work in museums, there's always a dialogue, this sort of high and low, similar to what Jonathan was saying about kind of the, the corner store and the elevated restaurant. New York kind of has hits every point in, in that art experience. Absolutely, and, and even hearing sort of this osmotic effect and, and sort of the permeable membrane between what an artist experiences or a chef experiences and what is then the cultural output of that and how the city speaks to artists and artists likewise back to the city. Yeah, um, there's a lot to be inspired by, that's absolutely. for sure. Absolutely, and, and diving deeper into sort of the work in the city that we've all experienced. And Jonathan, you know, I'd like to talk about your work in some of the greatest cultural institutions of, of New York and beyond. Um, you know, we hear about MoMA and all of these museums and, and our sort of chapels of the performative arts. And you know, there are restaurants and cafeterias and opportunities to sit and eat and drink and really make it a full sensory experience. Um, and you opened Lincoln Restaurant Day at Lincoln Center in 2010. You spent six years as their executive chef. You earned a Michelin star along the way. And it was also recently announced that you will be opening Cafe Leonelli, one of two restaurants in the new Nancy and Rich Kinder building at the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston. That's so right. tell us what it's like to create a culinary experience in a space that is already so much about the experiential. And does that backdrop of art influence your creative choices in the kitchen? That's a tough question. Uh, you know, if I if I take a step back and I think about <clears throat> art in our restaurants, uh, you know, the Time Warner Center is not a, a cultural institution. However, I I believe that you know Adam Tahani, the restaurant, the the designer that did per se, together with the team, both at Tahani Design and the Thomas Keller Restaurant Group really created a beautiful space with a lot of ar ar architectural artistic pieces. Uh, and then yes, you know, the, the space at Lincoln Center designed by Diller Scafidio and Renfro, you know, it was literally sandwiched between right. the, the 10 or 11 houses at Lincoln Center and the Juilliard School. So, mm -hmm. It was not, you know, it was not uncommon for Yo-Yo Ma and Maestro Itzhak Perlman and, you know, the list goes on to be dining in the dining room. And then the, half, the, the restaurant is almost complete, on three sides is all glass. Right. So our kitchen actually looked out at the Juilliard School. So you would, I don't know, be making a pasta at lunch and then kind of look over and then the, the, you know, you would see the students performing in the ballet class or, you know, the kids would come in with their instruments from the, from the sidewalk. And I mean, you couldn't help but being, but be inspired by everything that was happening around us in the restaurant. And we were, you know, a function of Lincoln Center. Certainly, we uh, fed thousands of you know patrons of Lincoln Center, and we were a you know a destination restaurant up there on the Upper West Side. But again, you it, it was amazing uh, to be surrounded by so much talent uh, and so many you know again thousands of people a day in the season would would be sitting in those different, you know, those different performance halls. And then, yes, if we look, you know, again, it looks like April, April 7th or 8th, we're going to open uh, in the brand new Kinder Gallery at the Museum of Fine Arts Houston. We're going to open a, a Cafe Leonelli, which will be the all day casual dining option at the museum. And then our team is also going to open at Le Jardinier, a fine dining, a fine dining French restaurant uh, later this spring. And I'm beginning to learn 
more about the museum and beginning to learn more about the city of Houston. Sure. Uh, but the Kinder Building and, and that brand new gallery uh, and the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, you know, I think we're accustomed to getting lost in the Metropolitan Museum of Art here for, I don't know, weeks at a time. Uh, <laughs> the Kinder Building is made up of, you know, it's a series of buildings, galleries that as part of this most recent renovation, they've enhanced, I guess, a system of tunnels that connects all of the buildings underground. And there are these beautiful, uh, both light and art installations uh, in these tunnels that connect the buildings. So again, a, uh, a really inspiring place to practice one's craft or art. Uh, right. Absolutely. And I mean, I can imagine looking out and seeing, you know, the young greats of tomorrow practicing what a creative energy to sort of put into your own practice. And likewise, how fantastic to be now working in a new organization that has put sort of artistic experience in the tunnel system. I mean, that really must be, you know, not that we don't love the good old MTA, but that must be slightly more inspiring walk to the kitchen versus, you know, fighting the masses. What do you think? We do, we do have, we do have artwork in the subway stations here. That is true. Uh, <laughs> true. But these, again, these, these light installations and the artwork that they've, you know, I guess, certainly the goal is to continue the experience, even when you're moving from, from one gallery to the next. Uh, really, really special. Sure. And now we did have a question come in that, that I do want to pose because here we are you know, talking about New York. What, if anything, are you bringing from New York to Houston? And from a creative industries perspective, how are you finding, you know, your work in Houston versus the many decades you've spent in building out restaurants in NYC? The, well, the Cafe Leonelli that we're opening in Houston is based on Leonelli Bakery and Leonelli Restaurant here in New York, probably closer in format to the bakery. Sure. There will be uh, counter service all day long. We'll open, uh, open in the morning with Italian breakfast pastries and coffee, and then move to all day dining. Initially, that's 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. And just like in New York, uh, we'll offer focaccia, focaccia sandwiches, salads, soups. I think what's unique about the cafe in Leonelli is that we'll, uh, we'll serve hot food from the, uh, the counter as well. So elements of Leonelli restaurant at the cafe in Houston, although no, no table service. Right, right. Well, so interesting, all of these new formats, you know, for the consumption of food and for art, certainly in the last year. And I'm, I'm glad you mentioned focaccia again, because that was one of the trends of 2020, wasn't it? Along with sourdough, I, focaccia art, a perfect, uh, a perfect topic for us to talk about. It was one of those great content um, sort of pieces we were seeing on Instagram and TikTok, and, and people were putting their energies in the height of lockdown into creating beautiful works of gluten. I mean, what <laughs> there's been a lot of bread that has been baked over the course of the past year. King Arthur Flower had a banner year. Yeah. Indeed. <laughs> and, you know, the challenges that both of our industries have faced, right, the art world, the restaurant industry, you know, it's forced us all into modes of operating that are decidedly not face to face. And previously, that's what we've known and loved, right? I mean, from the brick and mortar auction world to the restaurant business. Um, in the art world, it's forced us to go further into online auctions and facilitating private sales over JPEGs and online viewing rooms. And restaurants have had to survive off of takeout and delivery and meal kits and novel forms of you know getting great food to their great customer base. And since both of your careers are really firmly rooted in that interactive and experiential, right? Jonathan in, in elevated and novel fine dining establishments, Jana in brick and mortar auctions. How do you think the changes your industry ha has had to adopt to in the last year have influenced your businesses? And are those changes here to stay? Jana, let's start with you. Sure. I mean, it 
as you know, Colleen, this year has been, this past year has been insanely busy for online art businesses. Um, and I think that there's been a realization that online is essential, that it really has been a lifeline for people, even if their business isn't entirely based around online. I think it's been something that's helped, I know, you know, gallery owners, dealers um, get by in the last year is the opportunity to consign in auctions. And, you know, it, it has been, um, I think it shows buyers and sellers the reliability, the convenience of online. And that's something that I don't think is likely to go away. I think, um, especially as the world just transitions more and more online, people are going to expect to be able to transact in that way. Um, and of course, you know, the art world has been shifting in that direction somewhat slowly over the years, I think slower than maybe other industries. And part of that is just because of the the traditional ways of selling art i mean art is experienced in person one it has to be examined in person if you're selling it to confirm condition and things and there's also a very strong social aspect of course to the art world and i think we're all really missing that right now i mean there's a lot of excitement about fairs coming up in the future when those can be resumed i think you know there may have been some fair fatigue in the past but everyone is fully over it and kind of desperate <laughs> to get together again um so i think that that it's just really of course businesses that that did have a foot in online have fared a lot better that's probably true of you know every industry i mean we there's of course art in general the sale that we have up now they made the dif difficult decision last year to shut their doors after 40 years um and of course, the recent news about Metro Pictures and you know the Met has has said they're considering selling off you know deaccessioning works from their collection to meet their budgets. Um, so I think there's a lot of businesses that have been forced to make hard choices, and online has been a lifeline. So I think moving forward, there probably will be more investment in online, more um, acceptance, and even appreciation for that side of the business. But I think there will likewise be kind of a pendulum swing in the other direction where people will really want to get together and the in-person aspects of the business will also continue to thrive. Sure, absolutely. And, you know, Jonathan, now looking to you, talk about the lifelines and, and online. I mean, tell us, meal kits, ghost kitchens, delivery services, <laughs> um, what a year for dining, what a year for new and creative, you know, ideas to arise out of sheer necessity. Um, how do you think the digital influence will settle in the dining scene once face-to-face -face dining resumes in full force? And what's the word on the street with your colleagues and contemporaries? Well, you know, it's certainly been a devastating year for all of us. And I think, you know, Jana mentioned a number of things as it relates to the art world that also you know, relate to, to restaurants and art in our city. I mean, you know, Lincoln Center, uh, Broadway, music venues, uh, museums, you know, we haven't had access to these things for a year. And, you know, people, people are really hungry, uh, <laughs> literally and figuratively wow. for, you know, as Jana said, you know, there's a, there's a social aspect to going to a museum, going to a concert, going to a restaurant uh, that we're all hungry for. But sure. to answer your question specifically, you know, myself, my colleagues uh, have all had to look at our businesses differently. And, and, you know, there's been a number of services you know in addition to you know just meal delivery which we had a year ago but more experience driven you know we work with a service called get taste uh there are a number of uh sub subscription based services where like specifically table 22 that we work with where uh, you sign up for a monthly prescription it, and there's different levels or offerings and, you know, maybe you get a, 
a breakfast pastry kit every month, or you get a, a pasta kit and a full, you know, prepare at home meal. Right. Uh, we talked about bread. There's, <laughs> there's definitely a lot of uh, bread, pizza, focaccia kits right. out there. Right. And you know, it's so interesting. Right? We've seen this rise of sort of the hobby again, um, where I think for a long time, the world started to look at hobbies as they had to be side hustles, right? They needed to be something you were going to make money off of, and maybe it was the next career. But all of a sudden, we started to see experimentation for the sake of experimentation and this sort of altruism and sharing your sourdough starter with friends and sort of a socially <laughs> distant way to still connect and, and talk about um, a shared experience that were, uh, over, you know, an expanse. Um, and I wonder too, if, it, if through the rise of meal kits and delivery services, and you know, certainly being in New York, all of a sudden you could get food from restaurants where you could never get a table before, right? I mean, and all of a sudden you're eating Michelin starred food in the confines of your living room. Right. You know, there's been a whole other sort of wave of conversation in both of our industries of late, um, speaking to the need for greater inclusivity and diversity and accessibility um, because the art and the restaurant scene can be perceived as being exclusive, exclusive with high barriers to entry and even high, higher costs to stay and enjoy the offerings. So how do you see your industries addressing that conversation and is a way forward this idea of changing the offering so that it's accessible to more people. Jonathan, let's start with you. Well, I'm glad that, I'm glad that people are cooking at yeah. home more. Uh, and I'm sure that people are also painting and sculpting. And my wife picked up embroidery over the, over the past year. Uh, but yeah, the, the, the meal kits, the at-home offerings, th those are gonna be with us forever, I believe. I think our, our industry has learned. And uh, I look forward to the day when, you know, there are restaurants in New York that you can't get into. And it, that has nothing to do with uh, not welcoming people. Uh, but there was always, you know, there's always the joke in New York that, you know, New Yorkers always want what they, what they can't have, you know, that, <laughs> that, you know, you can't get tickets to that Broadway show or you can't get into that gallery to see that exhibition or you can't get into that restaurant because it's so red hot. And I, I miss, I miss the, the energy of New York and busy restaurants, busy bars, uh, you know, a line to get into the Met with my kids. Uh, but yes, I think that, you know, if there, if we, if we look at the positives over the past year, uh, things have opened up a great deal uh, in terms of what you have, what one has access to today. Uh, and, you know, people, people have learned a great deal more about cooking. I mean, we all had a lot more free time this past year than, than in years past. Indeed, indeed. And I love this line that New Yorkers want what they, what they can't have. And, and Jenna, I wonder, do you see that in auction, right? I mean, part of an auction is that whole gamification of, you know, the ideal is a bidding war. And all of a sudden you're bidding because it's an emotional thing that you don't want to lose. Um, how do you see New Yorkers sort of continuing their interaction with art from an experiential perspective, from a commercial perspective, and their buying patterns in light of everything that's happened um, in that conversation for the need to be more accessible, more diverse, more inclusive? Yeah, um, well, I think I've always worked in an area of art relative to kind of the um, million dollar paintings, it's been a bit more accessible anyway. I mean, prints and multiples, part of the, the attraction of them is that you can spend a few hundred dollars, a few thousand dollars on a work of art. You can go to a museum and be inspired by the work you see and, um, you know, actually own an original artwork by that artist. You can't 
easily get a, an original painting by, you know, like someone you would see in a, in a museum. So that accessibility is already kind of present in prints. You know, we have our art general sale now. There are several works you could purchase for a few hundred dollars, actually. So, um, you know, and I do think the online space makes things a bit more accessible. You know, walking into a gallery can be intimidating, not having access or social connections to purchase, you know, works can be intimidating. So I think, you know, online also kind of democratizes things a little bit. But in terms of, you know, uh, kind of the broader conversations that have been happening the last year or years around, you know, gender and racial equality, I think anyone who works in the art world would say there's a long way to go. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there's a, a lot of encouragement, at least I feel in that there's been, seems to be kind of a more prolonged conversation around these issues. And I know that everybody within our organization at Artnet is kind of like thinking about how we approach our day-to-day -day work and how to, um, you know, to make changes to try to address these things. And, you know, I know when I'm putting together auctions and estimating works, I'm definitely, uh, and along with my colleagues are thinking about, um, you know, looking looking to round out the offerings in terms of the usual but making sure women artists are included black artists artists of color certainly and we've had considerations about kind of things reconsidering things we take for granted like sale titles or sale categories and just making sure that we're kind of more respectful and approaching things in a thoughtful way um so i think that that you know while while there's no easy fixes and this is all you know very um entrenched in our culture i think there are i'm encouraged by at least the conversations that i've been having and the, the the actions we've been starting to make sure sure and you know another thing on the commercial side of the business is at our disposal is is the opportunity to give back and and i'm remiss for not noting it but actually a portion of art and auctions proceeds for this new york new york sale will go back to city harvest which is a critical organization that's done so much good beyond the, you know the pandemic but certainly in the last year in, in helping new yorkers stay fed which is you know of critical importance to everybody um and speaking of staying fed we have a chef we have you know an auction expert on the line we also want to know what you've been cooking what's inspired your cooking <laughs> and we'll take a little a little turn towards the fun here so to, to give us some context in 1628 robert burton's magnum opus the anatomy of melancholy he noted that cookery is become an art a noble science. And indeed, over the ages, there have been many parallels drawn between the process of cooking and the process of making art. And it's often said that cooking is art. So Jonathan, are there any fine artists that inspire your cooking in the restaurant, at home? Um, and Jana, same question for you. You know, sci uh, cooking is definitely science and art and in a restaurant about a, a million other things. Uh, <laughs> you know, we spoke about the importance of place and, you know, per se was a special place, Lincoln Ristorante, you know, our current restaurants, uh, Leonelli and Benno, and the work that uh, Jeremy Levitt and Parts and Labor Design did, you know, with us here in designing the spaces. So there's certainly a, a collaboration and an inspiration uh, taken from the physical space and, and the restaurant design. Uh, we, you know, are opening Cafe Leonelli in the Museum of Fine Arts Houston, and I know that uh, probably more gear, more appropriate or geared toward the fine dining restaurant Le Jardinier, but the pastry chef and the chef have had. You know, they're looking ahead at, at, at uh, exhibitions that are coming up in the spring and the summer to maybe uh, promote through pastry, uh, different works of art. And I think that that skill set, that, that metier, the, the, the pastry lends itself maybe, it's hard to it's hard to mimic an artist with with macaroni, um, <laughs> but the pastry world and and the architecture of fine dining desserts lend I think lends itself more to that. And I've certainly uh, 
have seen that done in the past. Um, you know, beautiful works of art uh, made out of, of, of sugar and chocolate. Sure. But so you don't have a Jackson Pollock style approach to plating them? No, no splatters, no? You know, in the late, in the late 80s and the early 90s, we did a lot of splattering. Um, <laughs> we kind of, I don't know, we cooking like, like our, like music, you know, there, there are cycles and there are trends. Um, we, we definitely went through the splatter phase. Um, and I see it now and again on Instagram. Uh, but no, no more splattering. No more splatter. Okay, good to know. No more splattering. Um, and one other question from our audience quickly before we get to Jana. Do we really eat with our eyes first? Well, you know, when you, when you walk into, you know, when you walk, when you go to, go to your friend's house for dinner or when, my wife is a chef as well. And uh, most would say a better cook than I am. Huh. And I know that like when I come home, when, when I open the front door uh, and she's been cooking, it's, it's the nose first right it's the sense of smell um but yes in a restaurant you know you order there's some there's a there's a mental process that happens you just you you decide you choose what you want to eat and then uh it is visual you know the waiter server puts the the plate of food in front of you you know, you, there's that look of amazement. I think a lot of people, and then I think a lot of people instinctually, you know, go for that, go for that smell. But right. yes, in, in most settings, it's, it's the sense of sight first, you know, followed by the sense of smell. And then of course, you know, the sense of taste. Right. But really it's, it's a full sensory sort of 360 experience by the time it's said and done. That's very interesting. Agreed. And Anna, you know, we've all been home. What have you been cooking and do you find yourself taking any, you know, inspiration from, from any artists, be them chefs or, or fine artists? <laughs> um, well, during the lockdown, my kids are pretty much in charge uh, of everything, but especially what, uh, they're such picky eaters. I've kind of given in at this point. So we've been eating a lot of cheeseburgers. That's really big in our house. Um, yeah, sort of reinterpreting a classic, I guess. I sometimes try to put more interesting things, at least for the grownups on there. Um, but yeah, it's like there's always been a connection between visual art and food. Um, you know, of course, Warhol's soup sets and everything, such an important work. Um, and I would say one of my favorite artists that uh, who's nearly singularly focused on food is uh, Wayne Tebow. He's not a New York artist, uh, more known um, from, you know, he's from California and has worked there his whole life. Uh, but I love his renderings of, you know, pies perfectly displayed with, you know, in bakery counters and the, the bright colors and exaggerated shadows and everything that, really, really great. Right. Well, for me, and forgive me for making this reference, but I must, I have to pull Bob Ross into the conversation for one moment, <laughs> only because I have taken such solace out of Jacques Pepin and Julia Child in this past year, watching their old sort of PBS 30 minute specials. And I just love their roll your sleeves up approach to cooking. Nothing can go wrong. It's fine. You made an accident. No problem. A little yeah. butter, a little white pepper, black, it will all be fine. And like Bob Ross, there's no such thing as mistakes, only happy accidents. I, I have found in the kitchen, that's been a great source of comfort for me, knowing that just, just keep going. It will, it will be fine. And I found <laughs> that Julia Child and, and Jack Papin, they, they bring that one home for me. Yeah, and I do think that like with everyone cooking at home, even though it's been fun and great, I know I'm really looking forward to having some professionals cook for me too <laughs> when all this is over. So, I mean, I have been going occasionally outside, but it's not ideal in the winter in particular. So when we all can eat inside and have something, you know, masterfully prepared and presented to us, that'll be exciting. Absolutely. And now just wanted to go to the flip side, flip side for one moment. You know, we, we spoke about um, Wayne Tebow, Andy Warhol. 
food has been a longtime favorite subject of artists, whether that's the beautiful sort of banquet scenes of the European old masters or Matisse and his extremely controversial take on apples and fruit or Irving Penn's frozen food photographs. Why is food such a popular subject for artists? What, what has captured sort of their mind and, and why put it on a canvas? Well, I think part of what we've been talking about, I mean, it's, there's, of course, food is essential, but it's also so enjoyable, you know, and I think the visual arts also have an element of, of that, of pleasure, of color, of experience. So I think it, it makes perfect sense. Right. And Jonathan, what about you? At, at the end of the day, are you sick of, are you sick of looking at food or why do you think food has Never. been and It's hard to have a, you know, hard to have a conversation with two art experts. Um, but I can think <laughs> about, you know, I can think about the normal Norman Rockwell painting of the Thanksgiving dinner and That's there's a big right. family and there's all these things happening. Um, food brings us to get, you know, food brings us together. You know, it, you know, it's important for nourishment and sustaining, but wow. it's, at its best, uh, it's enjoyable. Uh, for most, I think cooking is enjoyable, but I think the magic thing about food is that it brings people together. And, uh, you know, as, as Jana said, like we all, we're all hungry for a night out with our friends, uh, to be in a busy restaurant, whether it's, you know, your favorite place on the corner or a big fancy, you know, a big fancy restaurant, we all miss sharing, sharing a meal outside of our small circle, whatever, you know, if it's, you know, just, for, it's my wife and I, and we have two daughters and, you know, we were, you know, lucky enough, we live right outside the city in Westchester. So we were lucky to, to be able to socialize with friends outside a little bit. Um, but yeah, I think that's, to me, that's the answer to the question is food can be incredibly enjoyable. Couple that with the social aspect of it, bringing people together, friends, family, uh, even people you don't know. I mean, going to a busy New York restaurant and, and people watching, uh, mm -hmm. you know, we all, we all miss that. Indeed. Definitely. Indeed we do, but hopefully with these first whispers of spring, you know, I, I think we're all starting to feel a bit more optimistic about where we're going together, where we'll be eating together. Um, and we do have a few moments for, for questions and answers, which I do want to pivot to. And, and Jonathan, we have several for you. Um, one of our audience members wants to know, how involved are you in the overall experience of a restaurant? Um, speaking to the art and the design itself, knowing that ultimately going to a restaurant is that full 360 sensory experience. Well, I, I'm very, very, I'm very fortunate in that I got to, I have been able to participate in the conception, inception, execution of a number of restaurants going back to, you know, a junior member of the opening team of Craft Restaurant on 19th Street with Tom Colicchio and Marco Canora. Uh, I was a large part of the team that opened Per Se, a large part of the team that opened Lincoln, certainly Ben O. Leonelli. So specifically at, at Leonelli and Ben O, almost every, almost every aspect short of, you know, greeting the guest, although I do that sometimes too, uh, and serving the guest. Right. So the restaurant design, uh, uh, the lighting, the, the china, the glassware, the silver, the tables, the chairs, the artwork, uh, very involved in the whole experience. That's great. I mean, even seeing some of the plates from Cafe Leonelli, I mean, the typeface, the color, it really is, it does create a whole very comprehensive and cohesive experience. And a, you know, a cohesive and comprehensive brand, right? You have to establish, and we're, we're you know, we're still in the, in the process of doing that. But I mean, the, the restaurants are only three years old, and unfortunately, 
you know, we lost most sure. of this past year. Sure, absolutely. And now here's a question, you know, how did this sort of, we can do look at this twofold. How does building out an auction for, you know, Jana, you come from the brick and mortar world and, and certainly those institutions are global though perhaps your work at Art and Auctions now is even more global. So you're putting together these auctions for huge client bases. And Jonathan, you have created uh, menus for sort of more local institutions, institutions that have a bigger tourist base. Now you're creating menus for, you know, people in other states. How does regionality affect your work? Um, and are you pulling on local influence? How do, you, how do you sort of find that balance when putting together both an auction or a menu? I don't want to cut. I don't want to cut Jan off. Oh, I'll go first then. I guess. Um, I mean, I don't. I, it's funny. I don't think I typically approach an auction thinking about regions necessarily. I mean, unless it's distinctly about uh, the artwork of a certain place. Um, you know, like the sale, for example, or you know, we have Asian art coming up on our calendar. Um, but I think that especially you know when we're offering works at auction it's all sort of secondary market works that have an established auction history so we're kind of um you know putting together works that are of a certain uh you know kind of caliber or certain you know has kind of established itself in the market um and i think the challenge is just always putting together works that are auctions that um can kind of present them in a unique way and an appealing way and you know just in a broad way you know not speaking to just one audience but trying to um you know of course have the broad appeal so that that anyone who's interested in art will find something they might like right right and jonathan what about you i mean from a new york restaurant with a global client base you know a houston restaurant how do you approach that well <clears throat> you know we're all we're all business people and mm -hmm. You know, an online auction, not to state the obvious, the goal, the goal is to sell art. And in a restaurant, you know, it's a business and we have to fill seats every day in order to stay in business. And right. you know, I think Cafe Leonelli is a an extension of Leonelli in New York. And when we were conceiving, designing, and opening Leonelli in New York, you know, we are, we're located in a 155-room hotel. And mm -hmm. both Leonelli Bakery and Leonelli Restaurant, you know, we wanted those to be neighborhood venues, uh, destination venues for people in the city. But we also know that, you know, the hotel has guests from all over the country and all over the world. So, you know, Leonelli, uh, a colleague used the word democratic a while back. Uh, we need to appeal to a broad client base. Sure. We need to be accessible. Uh, that's not to say that we, you know, we can't express our art. Uh, and the same thing is true at Cafe Leonelli. You know, I'm learning more about the city of Houston. Uh, the, use, the, the museum is gearing is looking forward as we all are to reopening its doors completely and, and welcoming people back. So for us, again, it's a, appealing to a broad audience and getting to know the community and beginning to work with local vendors and suppliers. Sure. I think that's what that's what will set Cafe Leonelli apart for us and, and make it special is to, to try to find as many ingredients that are produced locally as we can. You know, are we gonna use Parmigiano Reggiano? Yes. Are we gonna use balsamic vinegar? Yes. But you know, there's a lot of a lot of relationships that we're developing with vendors that are that are unique to Houston. Sure. 
And that's certainly been a theme in all industries, right? Which is sort of shop small, shop local, shop right. artisan, shop craft. And, and one final question before we part for today from one of our audience members, this idea of cooking as craft, cooking as art. Um, you worked at a restaurant called Craft. When does it stop becoming a craft and start becoming art or vice versa? What is the definition for you? Well, I mean, that's a, I guess that's a, that's a, per, that's a personal question, you know, uh, you know, my kids are, my kids are fussy eaters as well. And, you know, putting up, you know, hamburgers or, you know, nine times out of 10, my girls are I'll ask for pasta, uh, you know, <laughs> is that perceived as art? Um, and what is art? You know, art is, it can be, excruciating art can be incredibly gratifying. So I can't say that every bowl of pasta that, I, that my wife and I put up for our girls is a work of art. Uh, I have been able, I have worked and I've been lucky enough to be a guest in, you know, gastronomic restaurants, mm -hmm. both here in New York and, and around the world. And there is a point at which, uh, you know, the, it's not just a bowl of pasta or a right. cheeseburger where, you know, sh chefs are creating what are, what are edible works of art. Right. Um, I, I don't do that. We don't, my wife and I don't do that on a daily basis for our <laughs> girls. Um, but I have been lucky enough to work in and be a guest in restaurants where uh, not just the physical space, but the, the, the artwork on the plate is is truly magical. Sure, absolutely. Well, and even though not every bowl of pasta can be a work of art, how lucky are your girls to have two chefs in the house to still serve that pasta, I mean, <laughs> oh, to be in those shoes. But Janet Greenblatt, Jonathan Benno, thank you both so much for taking time out of your weeks to chat about the nexus of art and food and beyond. Jonathan, we are delighted that, you know, we were able to sort of celebrate this one month countdown for you as you open this next endeavor at the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston. I know I speak for Jana and, and certainly the auctions team, we, we can't wait to be able to fly down sometime and, and check out what will be, I'm sure, a wonderful space at a fabulous museum. Um, well, thank you. And you know, let you know things are things are slowly coming back in, in the city that you know. I, I know you're in up in Connecticut now, but the city that we you know the city that we call home and the city that we you know that we love very much. Uh, hopefully, spring brings people out, and you know, confidence is slowly comes back. Absolutely. No, I mean, a note for all on the call, go to your local restaurants, order their meal kits, their cocktail kits, their pastry kits to make at home. They're wonderful. They'll feed your bellies and your souls and, and certainly soak in some art as well while you can. Um, our New York, New York auction is live through, Jenna, remind me of the date. Is it Wednesday? It closes tomorrow. It closes tomorrow on the 9th. Yeah. Um, and it does benefit the tremendous work of City Harvest, you know, an organization that is near and dear to the very heartbeat of New York City. We thank you again, and we hope you all have a wonderful week. Thank you again for joining us. Thank you very Thanks much. Thanks so much. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. Thanks. <laughs>